good morning. Uh, feel free to sing along. My father's mansion's many rooms have room for all of his children as long as we do share his love and see that all are free. You can probably guess my age from that. Now, this was a very inspirational song for me back in the 70s when I was a student. And it was at that time that I got involved in housing. I was a homeless student and we needed some place to live and there were all these empty houses. So we set up a housing association, to cut a long story short. Um, and we housed a lot of people and uh, that housing association is still going today. You can Google it, Bristol Self-Help Housing Association. It's still housing people 35 years later. So. I was very pleased in moving to West Cork. Uh, we moved in 1996. In 2001, a group of people in Baltimore had the idea of setting up a housing association. And I thought, great, this is a chance basically to do what I'm good at, to do what I like doing. And so Carberry Housing Association was set up as a community-based sort of people's housing association to provide housing for people who were excluded from the housing market. Now at that time, a lot of young people couldn't stay in Baltimore, Skiverin, because they couldn't afford housing. A lot of uh, companies uh, couldn't get key workers because they couldn't find any housing locally. So it seemed like a really good idea. So here we go. And we naively and, and sort of optimistically set out to set up projects, which we knew that the local authorities and everybody was gonna support. So we had our first luck, a uh, stroke of luck really, we got funding from the European Union to look at the feasibility of a sustainable social housing project for West Cork, renewable energy against social exclusion. And we had as partners Cork County Energy Agency, Northern Ireland Housing Executive, the network of social economy enterprises in Brussels, and we came up with a proposal for rural social housing development in West Cork. It was a bit harder putting this into practice. We found that in order to actually build it, we somehow had to secure a piece of land. Now, we could either get that privately or we could try to get it from the council. The council was not interested, neither the county or the town councils was prepared at this stage to offer. So we tried in the open market and then we found that all the sites were very expensive. Uh, it couldn't be afforded within the cost limits available to us. So we tried to put forward a site on an, uh, a piece of land that wasn't sold for housing, it was sold for agricultural purposes. We thought, well, developers are doing this all the time, why can't we? But no, <laughs> no, the council came down like a ton of bricks and said, no way you're going to build houses on this site. So that was the first scheme gone. So then we thought, let's get a site from the council. And we managed to find some sympathetic council officials who looked at sites and said, well, yes, we've got this site in Bantry, 30 acres we've got there, and it's not being used for anything. So yeah, uh, have a try at that. So we spent the rest of the money that we managed to raise, and we put together a project for 20 houses to an ecological brief, which included an eco-building community and permacultured grounds, only to be shot down in flames by the Western Committee of the County Council who decided that no, really this was a bit too much. Uh, we didn't want any more social housing. So our schemes ended up, sadly, again and again on the front page of the Southern Star as yet another sort of uh, project that didn't happen. Uh, and our wish to make partnership, unfortunately, uh, ended up uh, rather grimly, as you can see from our expressions in that photograph. At the same time, however, where we were getting support was from people who were homeless. From 2001 to 2006, we had 140 applications from households in West Cork who needed some place better to live. Now, they weren't all homeless. They weren't all sort of living in, in, in uh, sort of shop do doorways or under bridges. They were ordinary people who just didn't have a, a, a proper, secure place to live in. They could be young couples who uh, were living in flats that were too expensive for them to pay for with, with the sort of wages they were earning. They were uh, single parents uh, who were living in inappropriate uh, private uh, accommodation, for example, where, uh, that had no insulation, that had uh, no central heating, uh, that had front doors that opened onto a main road, which of course is the last thing that you want if you've got young children. Uh, there was even one lady who had a, a, a disabled child who was living in a rural cottage, far from medical services, 
uh, far from friends, and uh, the place flooded. So really, these 140 applications to me were the most devastating and searing uh, uh, record of, of the suffering and, and, and the need that was actually there and was, to a certain extent, being ignored. Now, this was reflected in Cork County Council's waiting list. From the moment that we started, 2001, until 2006, the lists doubled, practically doubled, in terms of people actually going on the housing list. Now, one of the things that we found from our uh, uh, research, from our, our housing list, was that 30% of the people applying to us were not even on the housing list. So I'd add 30% onto that if you want to get an idea of, 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 of the real extent of need. But this was going on even as our schemes were being knocked down one after the other. There was one sector, however, that was doing something quite different, and that was the development sector, the, the private building sector was booming all this time. And from 2001 to 2006, well, as you can see, production nearly doubled until it hit a peak of about 9,000 houses built within one year in Cork City and County. So you would have thought, well, this is wonderful. All these houses could be used to house people, but no. Unfortunately, at the same time, Cork County Council itself realized that an increasing number of people couldn't afford the houses that were being built. The heat of the construction process was pushing house prices up to the extent that by 2007, more than half of new households could not afford to buy the houses that were being built. Now, this is based on the index of affordability that local authorities now use, which was devised by Peter Bacon, and it's based on the, the, uh, the APR that uh, you can actually afford mortgages at. That clearly showed that um, something like 60% of people in West Cork that needed housing, not that were already housed, that needed housing, could not afford to buy any of the houses that were available on the open market. They needed social housing. They needed housing which was truly affordable. Affordability is defined by the United Nations as no more than 23% of available income. So, what was happening? If you look at the record of social and affordable housing being built by the local authorities, both county and city, during this period, it goes down. At the same time as private house building is bouncing up, we see a decline. This is taken from the Department of the Environment figures, showing that by the year 2006, there was almost nil, very, very little, vol voluntary uh, and, and uh, co-op production. Uh, a certain amount of local authority housing, but really a very small number of units, and a certain amount of affordable housing. Certainly nothing uh, to meet the sort of demand that you saw. Now what? We get to the year 2009, and there is a report by the University College of Dublin uh, by Brendan Williams, and it's called Managing an Unstable Housing Market, and shock horror, we have 345,000 empty homes in Ireland today. Now, obviously, you will say immediately, they can't all be used. Some are holiday homes. Yes, about 65,000 are holiday homes. And you can say, well, there's some that you can't use because they're going to be in a bad state of repair. They're waiting for repair. They're waiting for... Yes, take 5% off. You still have 171,000 homes, according to the UCD report, that could be used immediately if the mechanisms were there to use them. Of course, the mechanisms are not there to use them. And what have we got? We've got houses for sale that don't sell. We've got houses that have been for sale. This is a small trip to uh, Glengariff during the weekend. We've got holiday homes that aren't letting. I mean, they should be let by now. They're standing empty. We've got houses that were bought in order to make way for developments that, uh, it, that are not going to be used for development because no one in their right minds would do a development of this nature now. So they're standing empty. And more that, that have been bought in, in Main Street houses, again, standing empty, and even council-owned houses that are standing empty. Why are they empty? Because the council doesn't have the funding to do the repairs and to bring them into use. So, 171,000 empty homes, 
And here we have, what do we do with these houses? Well, sell them privately. Who's going to buy them when the market's depressed? Uh, it's the worst possible investment. The, the level of m new mortgages being issued is dropping to an all-time low. There's less mortgages being issued now than there have been in the last 15 years. Rent them. Well, they're available, but do developers really want to rent houses? Do the people that have built these houses, do the banks that have taken over the houses want to rent them? Do they have the mechanisms for actually renting them? It doesn't look that way or else they would be doing it. We could keep them empty until the market goes up. There, uh, that depends on how optimistic you are. Some people say the market's not going to go up for another 10 years. Are we going to keep them empty for 10 years? What's going to happen to those houses during that period? To me, the most uh, outrageous proposal is to knock them down. And I was very surprised to see this actually being proposed by uh, a new government minister. I would think it's outrageous to be knocking houses down when you've got 65,000 households on your housing list. House them and then start knocking down. But I think the knock them down idea is, is just bizarre. Requisitioning them, requisitioning them, well, we're already doing that. That's what NAMA is. NAMA is, in fact, a requisition of empty houses. NAMA is going to end up with loads of properties and land and so on uh, that effectively are going to be owned by the state and that we'll all have contributed to this bailout of, they say, 33 billion, uh, which will have to be paid in order to balance out those loans. So what's going to happen to those houses? The Irish Council for Social Housing has already asked that 100,000 empty homes be made available to housing associations and housing cooperatives to meet housing need. We'll see what happens. Watch this space. You, you could buy them for social housing, but who's going to buy them? I mean, again, we know that uh, after the McCarthy report, housing, social housing budgets have been cut. There are no new social housing projects being approved, only for special needs, only for, for, for people with disabilities, for elderly persons. There are no general needs housing projects being approved. So maybe rent them for social housing now. There's a good idea. And the government has introduced a scheme to actually subsidise rental being paid for houses that are used on a leased basis. Now that's good, but we'd add with the community, through community housing. Associations like Carberry Housing Association are ideal for actually leasing empty properties and making them available to people in housing need. We have people from the community on our committees. We have people with skills that are offering to help who would be willing and, 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 and dying to help. We have people going out to Africa to build houses, for God's sake. Why not? Let's have some of that charity at home. Let's bring some of the houses into use for use by local people. On leases from public and private sources. And we can agree the works that are needed on these houses, if works are needed. And we have an offer of loan funding from an ethical funding body called Clan Credo to actually finance the works based on the rental that the government scheme would give us for the length of the lease. So the rent to the owner could be calculated on the basis of the amount of work that's needed. If the property needs no work done on it, then the owner can take the 80% the, the of the market rent that's available. If the property needs work, then we need to use some of that rent or all of that rent to fund the repairs. But even if we repair a property and the owner gets no rent for it, at least the owner is going to have the property repaired, maintained, improved, and potentially available when the housing market picks up again. Oop, gone the wrong way there. Uh, the rent being paid by the occupant under the government scheme would be the equivalent of a council rent. So there's no question of people having to pay unaffordable rents and creating another poverty trap. Basically within this scheme, the, uh, the works or, or the rent of the landlord is paid by the government and the occupant pays a genuinely affordable rent. And management and maintenance of the property is the responsibility of the housing association. The deal is that the properties are returned to the owner in good condition at the end of the lease. Now you say, well, this is a bizarre scheme. If you've never heard of it, I actually uh, worked to exactly this model 35 years ago in Bristol. This is the way the Bristol Self-Help Housing Association worked. And we did in the first year 100 houses and subsequently every year the same number of houses. So, 
it's not only a good, sensible way of bringing houses into use, but it gives an opportunity for the community to actually come together and to, to, to pull their weight and to use their skills. It actually, it also gives an opportunity for unemployed building workers, unemployed young people to learn skills and to actually do something positive, uh, feel that they're doing something positive, feel that their, their life and their skills are contributing. These are examples of cooperatives in England. This is a big movement in England at the moment. Uh, there's a website that is called selfhelphousingorganisation.org, uh, um, which uh, is bringing together all these groups, but it's a big community led move, not government. I mean, we, we know what government does and what it can't do, but this is something that the community needs to take on board. Through a social enterprise, like a housing association, the Canopy Housing Project in Leeds, for example, is doing it as well. And it's an opportunity, as I say, for people to learn skills, to be employed, to come together. Certainly we can do this. I mean, this has been a great day and, and we're seeing many ideas, but we need, to, we need to make them happen. And in order to make them happen, the first step is to decide that we can do it and that we can do it here. Now, this is doable, this is possible. Uh, radioactive, yes. Uh, and, I mean, just think of, of how we can turn this, this, this crisis, this tragedy, into a positive situation where, where, where people can have pride and can have joy in actually uh, doing, doing something real and the right thing. This is also quite environmental. A lot of these properties are being retrofitted uh, quite effectively. I was very pleased seeing, going back to the website of Bristol Self-Help Housing, to find that they've undertaken a program of energy retrofit. Of, of their empty houses. Now we know that the biggest cause of CO2 emissions uh, is, is the building sector and domestic, old domestic housing is one of the main causes. So what, this is a very positive way to address the environmental issue. So to finalise, I'm just saying we need you. I mean, it's all very well to listen to our ideas and so on, but we need your help to make this happen. We need, you, we need your help to help us find the houses, to persuade the owners that this can be done. We need you to help us to get funding. I mean, we're working on a shoestring. We've got an overdraft. These things are expensive. Uh, these projects that we put to planning cost a fortune, to be honest. Uh, we're not going to make that mistake again. But some resources are needed. Fundraising ideas, benefits, whatever. We need your skills. If you can design, if you can survey, if you can build, we need that input in order to make this happen. So we basically need you to join us. Now, Carberry Housing Association is an open membership-led housing association. Anybody can join the committee selected. It's the community's organization. Um, you'll find my card at the table at the back. Please contact me, and if you can, and if you feel this is important, then join us. Or, if you don't live in this area, then set up your own. What we're doing is nothing special. It's not rock, rock, rocket science. Any locality can have a housing association. Any locality can have a co-op. The point is, we need to do it ourselves. It's enough waiting around for the private sector. We've seen what the private sector can do. We see it every day in the paper. Let's not wait for the council to do it either. We've seen what the council does. I mean, lovely to work with them. They can enable all sorts of things, but we need to do it ourselves. And this is really the message. Do it. Now, after this, and inspired by the TEDx experience, we're going to set up a Facebook group called Cube, of the campaign to use buildings that are empty. Please look for that page. Please input into that page. Please give us addresses, Please put information and we'll see what we can do from there. So, to finalize, the choice is ours to share this earth with all its many joys abound or to continue as we have and burn God's mansion down. Thank you.